Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Yeah, I thought it was. Let's call the meeting to order. Okay. Um, Mr. Turner was doing the uh, invocation and pledge, but uh, because of a trial that he's actually holding and so forth, he will not be here. So Mr. Carter has the honors. For this morning. All right. Thank you. If you would join me in prayer. Father God, as we come before you this morning to do the business for the citizens of Alamance County, dear Lord, we ask you to be with us, be with our meditations, be with our thoughts, our deeds, our words, those who are with us, dear Lord, that the actions that we take will be acceptable in your sight. We ask, Father God, for your grace and mercy as we pursued into this day and ask that you be with us keep us safe and sound for it's in Jesus holy name we pray amen, amen. congratulations to the, to the flag, flag of, of the United States, States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all At this point, we are going into a closed session. I know that's extremely unusual, uh, and we're reversing that, but it's because of uh, trial calendars and so forth of legal counsel. Um, so, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3-5 and 6, I ask that the board move into a closed session to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, to establish or to instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the positions to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the price and other material terms of a contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease, or to consider the qualifications 
competence and to consider the uh, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or condition of initial employment of an individual public office officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee. We will resume the... Uh, <coughs> Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry, but you're out of order. The uh, law. You're out of order. Sit down, please, sir. You do need to state the uh, property and. Mr. Sheriff, I need help. Purpose. Um, please don't let me take you that. Okay. Okay. The chairman needs to state the. Um, identify the property being considered for acquisition. You just the read it, Tom. Right. You just read okay. the thing. Right. But before it goes any closer, I'll make half remove you. Okay. Mr. Sheriff, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. We have uh, a motion that I am making. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we will resume the regular session following the closed session. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. point of order required to give the property owner's name, the location, and the use to which this board intends to use the property. I'm not sure I have the address. <laughs> it, should be on, it should be on your motion. I, if I may, I'll read it. I'll read it if, if you would, please. <clears throat> starting with uh, the exchange or lease for the property, as you read, located at 1128 South Main Street in Graham. It is owned by the Iberia Bank and it is being considered for the purpose of providing office space for the County Board of Elections and for other purposes of Alabama's County. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We're back in session. Let me announce now that we're back in session that we have met and consulted with uh, the county attorney and considered and given the county manager instructions concerning the, uh, the position to be taken on or about on behalf of LMS County, my class is held, in negotiating the price or other material terms of a contract or proposal, proposed contract with the acquisition of real property. Okay. Madam Clerk, we don't have any public speakers, is that correct? Not on the agenda item. Excellent. No commissioner responses? Do we have Mr. Turner? I assume he's back in a trial, so we may not have him for the remainder of this meeting. He's not back at this all right. Motion Just let us approve. know if he does return. Yes, sir. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Do we have a motion as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Elon University, it is truly my pleasure to say hello to you again. We met last week. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to the commissioners for providing a moment on your agenda to have an update from Elon University. My name's Connie Book, and I serve as the ninth president at Elon. And I appreciate you have a full agenda and you've already been working for several hours. <laughs> so I will um, be judicious with my time. Uh, I did want to just provide a couple of historical references to um, Elon, and you all remember Elon College. Many of you are native to the county. Um, this provides a snapshot of our movement from Elon College in 2000 to Elon University and the establishment of an infrastructure of schools. Uh, so we now have six schools at Elon University. Um, we have a slow growth enrollment uh, strategy, and since over the last 21 years, we've grown our student body. Um, we currently have 6,200 undergrads, 
and well sorry let me move 6300 undergrads in this new class and about 800 graduate students the graduate students are largely at our school of law which is housed in guilford county in greensboro uh, we also have a pa a physician assistant program um, and a doctorate of physical therapy as well as a few other a masters of education and MBA and a masters in interactive media so we have students from 46 states and 49 counties that uh, countries that is down a little bit uh, because of COVID and international travel um, but uh, six percent of our students this year are international students or dual visa students Elon um, just shy of 18,000 applications last year. Uh, we admitted 16, 15 first year students. It's considered what's called more selective. Um, and of those, 10% were first generation college students. So we've got great work. Our Pell Grant, Pell Grants go to students from the lowest income households and we have one of the highest four year graduation rates in the nation for those students. We're, we, we're largely female. This is happening. You probably saw in the news over the last couple of weeks uh, that um, schools are struggling to attract male enrollment. Um, Elon is 59% female and 41% male, 6% international this year. Just in case you're curious, some of the most popular majors uh, at Elon, psychology tends to be very popular, biology, finance political science and marketing. So still very traditional degrees and traditional enrollment uh, by our students. We have uh, 913 full-time staff at Elon and 489 full-time faculty. So uh, very proud of the employment progress we've made. We continue to work to scale, keep things small. That allows us to deliver that really strong four-year graduation rate. It's expensive, but we know it works. Our student to faculty ratio is 13 to one. Our average class size is 21. So still um, working on keeping those classrooms small. We are the only national, we're in the national ranking system. So it used to be Elon was a regional, South Regional University. We were number one, we liked being number one. Uh, but with a, uh, another entity decides whether you're national or regional and we were declared a national university in 2019 by Carnegie. Um, Elon enjoys um, a top 100 ranking. We're ranked 83 in the nation, um, just right there with NC State. Um, very proud of that. Uh, so uh, we are the only school in the top 100 nationally that has no classes larger than 50 students. So our largest class at Elon is 33 students and our average is 21. So very proud of that. Elon has worked uh, strategically over the last um, few months to launch our next strategic plan. So Elon, one of our six reasons we're successful is we use 10 year strategic planning. It's part of our culture. The reason 10 years is important is that it allows us to have a long view and to make incremental changes. If we were to turn that dial hard, it would force tuition to be turned up to. So we do very slow but steady progress. And so this plan, boldly Elon, bold, uh, because Elon is working on building national reputation on student success. Now that may sound ironic in that a college would have to state that, uh, but the truth is most colleges enjoy reputation from athletics or research. And so Elon is really working hard to position student success. We've got great athletics programs. Uh, we've got great research um, and both of those don't have to forsake student success. So uh, we talk a lot about student success at Elon. It's got four themes. So I'm just gonna touch briefly on what's happening right now at Elon. Uh, these four themes, learn, are about our academic, um, which our academic progress, which focuses on launching engineering and nursing at Elon, and also delivering a mentored uh, experience for all of our students. We also want all of our students to graduate with a data competency. 
that they can work with numbers. They can analyze numbers and make decisions with numbers. We also are investing in well-being and thriving. I know that's part of the mission of Alamance County. We want everyone to thrive and connect how we're partnering with the local community and um, other organizations and then rise about our work to, to solidify our national ranking. These are images taken just last week of our construction of our innovation quad. We were fortunate to be able to build a new elementary school for Elon Elementary and in exchange for 20 acres that sits in the middle of our campus. Um, that's the home site for a new quad dedicated to STEM. So it's a $50 million investment using local um, construction, local supplies, uh, and we, we work hard to do that with each of our construction projects. So really exciting to see this coming up out of the ground. We also, during COVID, received approval to launch nursing from the North Carolina Board of Nursing. So we welcomed our first 50 nursing students to campus. These are images from a new simulation lab um, underway. So it's nice to see students in scrubs, undergraduates at Elon. We also have an accelerated <coughs> Bachelor of Science in Nursing for people who have already earned a four-year degree and want to come back to school and earn their nursing degree. It's a 16-month program. If you drive through campus, you'll see this new outdoor fitness facility. I think COVID, we're, we've been really um, watching people enjoy our campus, taking walks in the afternoon, that well-being. So uh, the students partnered with us to, to put an outdoor workout. Y'all should all do it. <laughs> it. Takes 30 minutes. It's three minutes on each of the, uh, and it's open to the public, and we put in a half-mile walking trail around it. We're really proud of some of the partnering programs we do in Alamance County. One of them that's very successful is called It Takes a Village. We were working with four Title I schools on literacy. The, the, the strategy behind this program is when you teach a student to read, you bring their whole family and it creates a legacy of reading. The data was so powerful that the uh, foundation who funded the previous program came back, gave us another million dollars, and asked us to expand it to all 12 Title I schools in the county. So now we have uh, over 200 Elon students, faculty, and staff volunteering in after school programs in all 12 Title I schools every day of the week in Alamance County. We provide dinner as well as part of that to take home. We also started a pilot last summer. And this is a program that we are piloting in order to grow, where we place and pay for Elon students to intern in local entities, nonprofit and for-profit here in Alamance County. It's called Elon Interns Advance Alamance. And it's a summer program, and these are <coughs> just scenes from that program. I just had breakfast with the students and their supervisors uh, from all across the county, and it was it was great. It was, they learned a lot both directions, and uh, I think we'll, they're, we're going to make some changes and, and come out next summer even stronger. We also signed in December a program with ABSS School System and Alamance Community College to establish a program at Elon called the Alamance Scholars. This is a program that allows us to supply teachers to the county at, and graduate with no debt. Um, so this is um, an innovative approach. Uh, they, we work in partnership to build a pipeline with the K through 12 system. Um, they go to Alamance Community College their first two years and then their final two years at Elon. The goal of this is at least 25 new teachers a year back into Alamance County. And I always tell people to join me in the vision of four years and 100 teachers. Um, and, and just to keep doing this. This is a program we're also planning for our nursing program. Those are the two areas of critical shortage for the county and Elon wants to be a leader in helping um, to supply great teachers and great nurses to the county. Our graduates, we're number one in, among all higher ed in North Carolina for employment. We are a net employer to North Carolina, uh, so proud of that. And just looking at the data, this is in the middle of COVID, we were still able to achieve all of these great um, outcomes. And the average starting salary uh, for an Elon grad is 51,000. 
We established six count committees with the town of Elon to, to deepen our partnership there. We do great work with the town of Elon, and of course, we're right in the middle of, of all of uh, their efforts. And so these six new committees are working, um, dedicated to, to communications, developing that the town of Elon, having a safe environment, uh, and doing good economic development. One of the things that we released last week was the, an impact study of how Elon drives the local economy. And so you can see here that we, um, in the state of North Carolina, have just shy of 700 million impacts, 7,400 jobs, and our state and local government revenues were 34.6 million. Here in Alamance County, the economic impact is 372 million, direct and indirect, 5,700 jobs. 18.8 million. You probably are aware we launched, a, we opened a new hotel, and that new hotel alone generating $400,000 in new tax revenue. Um, it's a very proud, that is a for profit hotel, and it is designed to generate profit, and that profit comes back into scholarships at Elon. So proud of that. So we're awarding our first $850,000 from profit into scholarships, and Alamance students will have the first priority um, on those scholarships. We have 146,000 visitors every year that helps fuel that economy. And one of the things we really hope that folks will join us for, one, is our great athletics at Elon. Um, we're always happy. The football team won on, on Saturday, which is a great mood on campus, but we've got soccer winning. We've got volleyball, uh, track and field. We have 17 different NCAA sports, and we are a Division I um, athletic conference, but we also have a great speaker series. So we just had U.S. women's soccer captain Carly Lloyd gave a great remarks uh, last week to, to families and to Elon students, and, and we've got more coming. So we do um, really value these uh, moments of engagement, and we've got a great theater program, and it's great to see all of the Alamance County residents come out and support athletics and our performing arts, so very proud of that. So I will stop there and take questions uh, from the commissioners. Thank you. I have a question for you. Do you have a program, look at my hair, yes. do you have a program for senior citizens who might want to re-engage in education uh, my degrees in political science I might want to look at something else do you have a program specifically for that I I called about one of the programs a couple about a year or so ago and for somebody who's retired there so they were a little steep so we have a program called life at Elon and that program is designed for senior citizens and we have several hundred senior citizens um, it is, so that's not exactly what you're, you're, you're asking about, but we do, that program is designed for many workshops, cultural programming, um, and we have several hundred residents uh, participate in that full complement. So it's not a degree program. It is not degree program. Last year we launched Elon Next, which is certificates and um, non-degree seeking credentials. And we, so that is up, you can see it on our website. We're just now hiring the director. But our goal is to be able to provide to the county, and we did, we did a special uh, workshop series for social, Alamance County Social Services. We've had several of the businesses take our Excel certified class. These are more affordable, lower hanging kind of certificates, quick in and outs where you can gain some new skills. It's an area we're hoping to continue to grow as part of Boldly Elon. I would like to state Craig Turner, the board member that's uh, in the middle of a trial right now, but currently a board member, obviously, uh, is a graduate of your Elon Law School. I'm a graduate of Elon undergrad, uh, which prepared me very, very, very well for Wake Forest Law School. So, and I was a business and accounting major at Elon. Uh, you have a lot of things ongoing that I've just noticed. Well, for example, you had a soccer game uh, this past week, and one of my grandsons 
uh, was asked to be a ball boy. And he Very thinks nice, that's the yeah. best thing that has ever happened to him, <laughs> of being able to be on the sidelines and, and work the sidelines and so forth. And you, you do involve the community. Um, Rich McGeorge was in my class, graduating class, uh, and I tutored him in math his senior year. Uh, he was very, very pleased to make that, and just a, what a ball player. He may or may not still hold the record for the most receptions for a tight end with the Green Bay Packers. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. If he's lost that record, it's been <laughs> relatively recent uh, that he would have lost it. Um, but just a, a, and was the number one pick for the Green Bay Packers in 1970 out of Elon in those days college. Yeah, very nice. And so. we do have professional football player right now with the Minnesota Vikings. We've got professional baseball players with the Seattle Mariners. I do think one, just to, to speak to that um, chairman uh, Paisley, that we do value that interaction. So North Carolina is the number one destination for Elon graduates. Right, so they are, we still have 19,000 alumni that live across across the state. Um, we value those partnerships. The e, uh, the Elon interns program is designed to get them excited about beginning their career in Alamance County, um, and we do have teachers and uh, others that and finance folks that begin their career here, and we're proud of that. Uh, we also fund a service year program for recent four Elon um, graduates and then we started with four and we just went up to six that spend a year working in Alamance County. One is with the Economic Development Group this year, a new one, um, but with um, our different nonprofits in the area, Impact Alamance, Alamance Achieve, some of the health equity programs, so very proud of those individuals who are here working and living in Alamance County. Let me mention one other thing. Uh, one of the reasons that we're so honored to have Dr. Book here today is because of roasted coffee right across the street that many of us have enjoyed. Uh, about a month or a month and a half ago, a young lady, a rising senior this year, by the name of Mrs. Miss Cook, Miss Cook, uh, was in line in front of me at Roasted Coffee. Uh, I don't know why, I'm just in line. Uh, and she turned around and there were two, two young ladies there. Uh, and she said, I'm buying his coffee. Yeah. I didn't have a clue who they were. Yeah. Uh, and so I, uh, after she purchased my coffee for me, I said, ladies, who are you? And they both gave me, as all you ladies do, first names only. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, at that point, I asked what their majors were, uh, and they both were in the medical field. Uh, and we had just completed a meeting, and uh, see Mr. Vipperman in the back, with uh, emergency services and so forth, uh, about the shortage of personnel. And so as a result of that, I contacted your office, and you were so gracious as to invite um, us over, uh, Mr. Haygood and myself and, and so forth, for a meeting to discuss working with the county and Elon University. Notice I used the university that time. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and so we really, really look forward to working with internships, possibly employment opportunities, all kinds of things, because we as a county have a real need for personnel. Uh, and Mr. Vipperman also suggested, I said to Ms. Cook, that she contact um, various uh, services, Alamance County Rescue, to, uh, to therefore gain knowledge, experience, and so forth. So that will hopefully benefit her. It also benefits us. Um, so I just really appreciate Elon University, and you particularly, reaching out to us. Well, we're very proud to be um, here in Alamance County. I think it's a great asset to the county that you have such a strong community college and university right here in the county um, to help deliver workforce and educational opportunities. So I, 
there's many counties that don't don't have that impact of, of both of those available, that higher education impact. So it's grateful to be here. So thank you. And tell Miss Cook, I will gladly repay her <laughs> a, a, the cup of coffee. What a what a great deal. They she really did. are great young people. Yeah. So I'm proud to be the president there. Just good young people, great values, want to make a difference in the world, and so very. Uh, I mean, I'm pleased to hear that story because they are young people that really truly want to make a positive difference. Yeah. Well, it's for so cool a to young student to, to reach out like that, just yeah. not having a clue who I was, yeah. uh, was just <laughs> very, very impressive. You're doing a good job. I apologize. It's so nice to see the lot where the elementary school was. I thought that's going to totally bring that campus just to what it should be and as a former school board member i can't thank you enough for how you guys work with us for that school yeah the millions of dollars it saved it was just amazing, amazing. and a great construction timeline that ended up saving so much money um yeah. so really grateful sam it partnered with us on They're that awesome. so that they was do great, great work. very good well thank you all thank you thank, thank you. you and you're welcome back anytime <laughs> Okay, um, we have two folks I see here, and maybe more. <laughs> uh, I see several of the board members here. Ms. Holland. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate you seeing us. Um, I was asked to keep this brief. <laughs> you busy tomorrow? What you doing? Oh, just a few things. <laughs> <laughs> this is just meant to be a pictorial tour of our facilities short of you seeing this you would have to come out in individually or you know in small groups to see what we do and so we wanted to do this and just zip through it I'm going to keep going the slides are titled if you have questions stop me okay, <laughs> okay. I am going to this, is, this was our first building. It used to be the CIS building. That was our first building. And then that's our current building. Y'all saw, saw our tent last year. And I served many, many years in that building. <laughs> the, it says vault. It's not a secure vault like you would think, but it's, it's vaulted off for us. Um, that's our middle storage room. This is why we're meeting at MedCap, because we're using the boardroom that we used to have for workstations. And so you can see it, it's full. Those are bags going out for tomorrow. That's our back hall. We get in trouble with the <laughs> A lot of times because the uh, shelves go too close to the ceiling. There's a rule about that. Um, this is our part-time room. Now, right now, well, I took this Saturday, so there wasn't anybody in there. A lot of things, if you, if I have two slides, this is the left of the room, and that's to the right of the room, He's standing at the door. We can get four workstations in there and two table stations. This is our attic. You can tell it looks unorganized, but it is really organized by what we know is there. It's just a lot of stuff. <coughs> this is our building behind the Board of Elections and this again more things and these are all necessities to pull the elections together <coughs> this is our voting equipment warehouse I think I have three shots of this currently these are the um, DS 200s lined up that's the tabulator machine on top of that we have um, boxed signs that we put out curbside bells uh, if you see the on the right screen you see the boxes with the little cords we keep and if we have curbside bells that break we keep the stuff and then piece the parts back together instead of buying new bells so uh, we're, we're frugal let's say these are the security carts that you approved for me to buy with with the grant money and we're excited for them to come in you can see we're able to get the things that were stacked on shelves as you can see behind it we were able to get are going to be able to get those things inside of those security shelves and you can or carts and you can see that they have the lock on the cart and that's going to make it more secure when it goes out uh, on Monday like today we're sending things out it's going to make it more secure in the polling place themselves make the chain of custody for the machines more secure 
This is MedCap B, and uh, this is kind of going in the front door over to the left. We have two workstations, and there's some empty floor space. Um, that's today that is lined up with people coming in to get their supplies. The chief judge is coming in to get their supplies. Okay, this is looking as you come in, see the door on the left hand screen where the uh, green door, that's coming in that door and looking down towards that ballot room and I did not show you in the ballot room. Um, and then this is inside where the uh, <coughs> black bags, the precinct supplies that go directly out to the precinct to the chief judges. The things you've seen so far are things that are taken by the county facilities department or they're used as backups, but these are the things that go directly to the chief judges that they keep in their possession. Those would be your um, binders when you go in and they check off your name, uh, ballots, those sort of things. Okay, this is C, and I, this is a 2020, this is a past, but I want you to see what we ended up using that, that room for, and it was such a blessing on uh, in September of last year. We had kept it open because there was a possibility we were going to have to do something with another department and so we were asked to keep it open and then they released it to us in August and we immediately stacked it with workers and they were packing the ballots on the right. We had about that many ballots going out every day so there's no feasible way that we could have had that production in our current office. I mean we, we areas like that are needed for you know, staff work. I mean, there's, we start, when I started, we had, I think, and that was 31 years ago, we had, it was uh, right about 40,000 registered voters between 35 and 40,000. Now we have about 110,000. So, I mean, we really have a lot of, of production we have to do for an election. So, this is what we're using MedCap C as now. We use it for our board meetings because, you know, we need somewhere we can spread out. We use it for our recount area. If you'll recall, in the 2020 election, we had to do two recounts, two hand-to-eye recounts. So again, blessing that, that we hadn't moved the equipment there yet because we were able to stack that uh, facility full of workers that could recount. Uh, how many ballots did we, how many do we have to vote? 75,000, some in excess of. And that's a lot of work to do in a short time frame. So that's what we did in the back. Now you see the um, PPE that's going to be going out to the polling places that uh, we provide to them. And then you see in the back there a cage to a uh, cart that we uh, have over there for the space. Okay, this is, um, do you remember when we were talking about MediCap? I said that, and I think I told the county manager this is not, but via the county manager, I said that I thought that we probably could not get the voting booths in there, but I didn't think that that probably was a good idea anyway because you've got these booths and you see this to, together is a combination of how many there are. Um, the truck on the right is loaded. On the left, that's what's left in the storage facility. But I didn't think that you would want to use your high dollar rented lease space for something that we're not touching daily because it takes up a lot of room. So I thought you know that would be acceptable to keep something like that in a, a facility of that manner. So the other, uh, this is the second unit, and these are curbside signs, crowd controls, uh, crowd control barriers, traffic signs, the PPE, metal screens. This is all, or these are all things that we uh, acquired last year with grant funds. The county didn't pay for these things. Uh, sneeze guards, these are the sneeze guards. Again, together, they make what goes into the one storage unit. Um, this is truck loaded on the right. Now that's for to put at your. Uh, yeah, I mean, you just don't think, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> you know, we, we put all of these things out, so we have to we have store them all. And this is another thing I said probably would not be the best utilization of leased space. I mean, at, at the cost you're paying for MedCap or, or anywhere else. Uh, this is our fourth storage unit. We keep absentee supplies in there, what it shines we couldn't fit at the other places, and pre-destruction area for um, pending lawsuits. We traditionally can destroy the election items 22 months afterwards, but if we are involved in a litigation, whether it's for Alamance County or a statewide litigation, we can't destroy the products, the uh, voting things. So. 
you know, we have to hold them somewhere. We don't want to hold them in the same facility with things that can be destructed because then there's the chance that uh, it might get into the wrong hands and get destroyed. I'm currently in a lawsuit, or uh, we <laughs> are currently in a lawsuit for the Ivotronics, and I'm having to hold on to some, and you know, we've been, that's been, what, <laughs> three years now? And we're still having to hold on to things from elections, from our last election, our last presidential with that, so that was 2016. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is the timeline that uh, Dr. Yarborough read to you, and I think Tori has got you a copy so that you can have it. These are just our moves that we've done. As you can see, they, after 2023, when we moved out of the J.B. Allen courtroom basement, we've just been from pillar to post, and I'm not going to sell you that story again. You know we need space. Um, I'm going to turn it up. Do you have any questions from me? The Medicap lease terminates November 30. Yes. Sir. So you will lose that, that entire space effectively November 30. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. And so we've got to replace that and very, very quickly. Yes, sir. Um, how many total storage sites, counting the building that you're currently in, and the outbuilding behind it, and it, how many locations do you have currently? Um, let's see. Board of Elections, uh, MedCap B and C, I'm going to count those as two sites, the four storage units, and the, counting the attic with us, I'm assuming, and the eight. Eight facilities. So if we were able to have one location, the county owns the building down here, but we're leasing, paying monthly rental, yearly rental, on all the other sites. Is that correct? That's correct. Now the storage units, the uh, at the storage facility, we pay a monthly. But I mean, it, it's really for what? Uh, again, comparing, and I know some people know real estate better than others, but comparing the lease space that it, or it, or even the, if we owned the space that we would be taking for things like those booths or the sneeze guards, you know, it would be you know, really prudent, I think, to keep those things in a separate, and, and if the county is only going two places when we have to uh, load up for elections, that would, I mean, right now it's counterproductive, I mean, as far as staff time goes. So right now, staff time, uh, gasoline, transportation, all kinds of issues, if we can find a location, yes, uh, would resolve those issues would also resolve a lot of the leasing issues. Yes, sir. How about security? Well, you know I'm going to be secure. You know I'm going to ask for the moon and do. You know, we have three-factor authentication on everything. But you my know. point being, be much more secure yes. in one location Absolutely. as opposed to eight locations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and I will mention, you know, that we're not just talking about counterproductivity for our office in time. We drag many other departments down with us. <laughs> we uh, have facilities that support us. IT supports us. County management team obviously supports us. HR, I, I just could go Sheriff's on and on. Department. Sheriff's department, yes. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Sheriff. Uh, so, you know, the, it would be very productive to, and secure to have things in one location. More questions? just so nice to not have our Board of Elections on the news about any kind of anything. Yes, we just see you guys do a great job. Thank you. And I've got my board here. My chairman is, uh, chairwoman is re uh, ready to speak to you if you have questions for her. And I think we, we uh, met with her at our last meeting, yeah. I believe. And we she gave that. us her life story. <laughs> <laughs> and she did speed She's reading. not bitter or anything. She's good, but we she know is. where she's been. She is good. You are right. We are so pleased with our board. We have a very supportive board. When I mentioned, you know, people we have with us under support, we have a wonderful board. They work together. You know, I don't see um, partisanship come into play, and, and we're very blessed, like you said, in Alamance County. I get to serve with Dorothy on the Senior Services Committee. She's quite a warrior, so I appreciate her <laughs> advocacy for everything she does. And for the record, would you each just simply give us your name and your position, please? Dorothy Yobler, Chair. Uh, Noah Reed, Secretary. Dan Engel, Board Member. Brian Ray, Board Member. And we truly appreciate each and every one of you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Any other questions? 
We thank you. Yes. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Have fun tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you all have a short day tomorrow, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, the Oversight Committee, Mr. Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, next item on your agenda is a request to uh, adjust the membership of the Capital Oversight Committee. Uh, the commissioners will recall that the Capital Oversight Committee uh, is created through our capital plan document uh, that the board approves every year along with our uh, budget. The Oversight Committee meets quarterly and they review information from the Technical Review Committee, which is, consists of members from uh, ABSS, Community College, County Management. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis to review capital projects, talk about how those are going, and then we report quarterly to capital oversight. The oversight Committee is also tasked with ranking future projects and reviewing the capital plan before it comes to the board. Uh, representation from the school system, the college, and county government makes sure that everybody's on the same page when the final version of the capital plan comes to the commissioners. The current makeup of the Capital Oversight Committee includes two uh, county commissioners, which at this time are uh, Chairman Paisley and Vice Chair Carter. We we'll also have two members from the Alamance Burlington Board of Education, that's their Chair Gant and Member Patsy Simpson. We also have uh, currently one representative from the Alamance Community College Board of Trustees, and that's General Williams. So uh, at our last oversight committee meeting, the community college is interested in um, uh, requesting that the commissioners amend the way the uh, oversight committee is structured and add an additional board of trustee to make it be two representatives from each group. The college believes this would be good. I think they have trustees that are interested in also being a part of this discussion on a regular basis. This was discussed at the technical review committee and at the uh, last oversight committee. I believe the oversight committee did recommend that the commissioners go through with this change. So at this time, I'm requesting that the board consider amending the uh, makeup of the oversight committee to add one additional board of trustee from the community college. I'll make a motion to approve that request. Oh, no, it's fine. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I do have a question for you guys. You're going to make it, right now you're five. Yes. You want to make it six. Yes. Okay. How is that going to be good for settling things when you have an even number of groups? This is an advisory board only. Okay. Uh, so they really don't take votes on okay. uh, Just things thought I'd that will, yeah, no matter how they vote, we as a board make the final decision. Okay. Indeed. Just, Just a rec recommendation. recommendation only. That's what uh, I thought. Just thought I saw six being an even number. I thought that's some kind of. <laughs> you might have a tie. <laughs> right. <laughs> we could have a tie vote on, yeah. on an issue. It's, it's possible. But I don't know that it would, we simply would report what the yeah. vote was indeed okay mr albright do you see any conflict with having an even number no even if even if you had five on there it was five to nothing this this board would not have to take that recommendation that's right it was exactly. the final arbitrar of the decisions made mm -hmm. thank you thank you okay we have a motion and a second any other discussion all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Again, unanimous. Thank you. Yes, sir. And I think you're next again. Yes, indeed. So, uh, commissioners, the next item for your consideration is uh, ARP American Rescue Plan discussion. So, just recap. This is a very brief recap of uh, where we've been so far. Alamance County has been allocated thirty-two million nine hundred and twenty-five thousand one hundred thirty-six dollars in American Rescue Plan funds for uh, county government. At this point, the commissioners have approved to spend one million twenty-five thousand seven hundred sixty-four dollars to uh, fund several mental health agencies, purchase some equipment that uh, is needed by a couple of county departments to, in their uh, efforts against COVID, and to approve three new positions in county government that are uh, uh, also COVID related. The uh, board has also voted to spend American Rescue Plan funds in the amount of $3,842,981. This was to cover reimbursable expenses the county incurred from March to June of 2021, which we have taken those funds and put them in designated fund holding. So those funds are still there to spend. They are just no longer ARP funds. ARP Let me, now, that's in a designated fund, correct? Yes. yes. All right. I keep hearing on the radio that all of a sudden in the general, that's not the case, is it? That's correct. These these 
This $3,842,981 that the board voted to spend of ARP funding has been placed into a designated fund specifically uh, for these funds to be held visible to the board. So while they have been spent from ARP, they still remain at your disposal to be spent, frankly, as you see fit. Uh, I would suggest as you work through these ARP related projects, you may want to spend some of them on uh, ARP related projects. But the the benefit, my opinion, is you freed these funds from the ARP restrictions, right? But so the you, point being, they did not go back into the general fund, as we keep hearing on erroneously right. on the radio. They are designated funds. So they are tracked and designated as used for uh, ARP related purposes or COVID purposes. And I was called a liar on. Friday morning because I made a comment to the effect that these funds couldn't be used to reduce taxes, but they can't be used to reduce taxes. Am I correct? So these these funds are designated for your use. You could do what you want to with them. Uh, you know, we what what I've suggested to you is hold them and maintain them until you review all requests for ARP related spending. But they think you can do whatever you want to. But as Mr. Carter correctly stated on the radio, mm -hmm. um, we cannot use ARPA funds. To reduce taxes. That's correct. Yes, yes, that is correct. And he pointed Indeed. that out correctly on the radio. Yes. Thank you. You've also the commissioners have also uh, approved one million seven hundred and twelve thousand three hundred fifty dollars to be spent for the uh, HVAC project at the Human Service Center. This was uh, the project. I think we came last meeting or maybe the meeting before. Last they kind meeting. of yes uh, to do the massive replacement of um, HVAC infrastructure at Human Service Center. So currently. ARP funding remaining out of our original allocation. The remaining ARP funds are $26,344,041, or you could look at that as $30,187,022 if you include that $3.8 million as part of your consideration. But ARP funding unspent, unallocated, uh, $26.3 million. So all that to say, uh, up until this point, you know, we've had numerous discussions about does are the commissioners interested in soliciting any a further input from the community about how to spend these funds you know county government has been uh, county management we've been talking with county departments about various needs and that's where some of the spending has come from thus far county department spending or nonprofits that we're already connected with right some of the mental health agencies that the board has approved ARP spending for are ones that we already deal with family abuse services crossroads so uh, at, I think we're at a point where it might be valuable to the commissioners to have any other level of discussion about is there a desire to solicit any other input uh, or give uh, nonprofits or individuals the opportunity to express to the board their ideas about ways to, to spend these funds. That is not required uh, in the ARP guidelines, but you know, we, we have been fielding calls from nonprofits and individuals who just uh, say, I want to tell somebody what I think about ARP and how it should be spent. So. Before you make a motion, I just want us to realize that um, this is just my personal opinion. There's been all kind of discussions about all kind of different ways to do this. Um, I think as commissioners, I think it's very important that there are entities in this county that want to come before us to request funds. I don't think they need to go through other entities for the entities to tell us what they need. I think everybody that the our nonprofits stand on their own. They're amazing groups and they do things that people don't even know until you're absolutely in that situation. And I think that I can only speak for me. I'm 20%. That's it. <laughs> I want to hear this straight from these folks that are asking for this money because I want to give them 100% of my attention. I don't want anybody else vetting them. They don't need vetting. They do real work and they can speak for themselves. So I just think it's very important that we interact very personally, like the dude behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz, not the big head <laughs> and the fire. I just think it's, it's an honor for us to hear them and plus for all of us to really get to know our county and realize what all that our county does. We are elected and we vote and we agree and stuff like that, but we don't do the actual work. And I think as leaders, we need to hear from the people that do the actual work. I think it's so important to respect them and listen to them and, um, and help them any way we can because every nonprofit that's worked with any kind of whatever has took a hit because of COVID. And the sad thing is, and the reality of that is, whatever they work with didn't stop. Hmm. Violence didn't stop. All this didn't stop. And they still ran into the fire to save people. So I think it's very important just on my opinion. 
I want to hear from them. I don't want somebody else telling me about them. I think it's their right to speak for themselves. Well, I had uh, over the last two, me two, three weeks since our last meeting, I've had conversations in several different meetings with people, and I've been, unfortunately been encouraging them to tune into today's meeting because I was hoping we would have some information on what we can and can't do with ARP, but I've been pointing out the whole time we don't really know, and we may not know what we can and can't do with these funds as late and maybe even later than December 31. So it's, it's a little premature, I believe, for us to try and propose meetings, propose whatever, until we can actually tell the community what we can do with this money. And, and we really, uh, we're doing what we can with what we know we can do and fortunately what we're being told is we may be grandfathered on what we're doing right now but that's all county related and reimbursing county related expenses that are relative to COVID. So I would like to make a motion to table this discussion until we have more detail and can really discuss it intelligently with our constituents. I'll second that motion. If there is any discussion, I just think that sometimes it would not hurt us to meet with all of these folks that are wanting to talk to us about this money to get that part done so that whenever the Treasury decides what we can do, we would be ready to hit the ground running instead of waiting till December for all of these folks to come because I guarantee the ones that are talking about needing this money need this money now. They didn't need it five months from now. They, they needed it yesterday. So I, I just want us to think about that. That's something we could go ahead and do in preparing for this. That wouldn't hurt a thing except to go ahead and get all this knowledge and be ready to move whenever we get the go for what we can do with. Would, Mr. Carter, would you want to amend your uh, motion simply to table it for our next meeting in October to discuss having... What information we've gotten at that point in time? Okay. Sure. And Mr. Higgins, I just have one question. I, just I to, need to... I, I'm sorry. I, I'm I sorry. approve this. The second also approves of that amendment. I, I apologize. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. I just wanted to clarify something. Um, yes, sir. These funds that we're talking about, the ARP funds, have to be spent two years from now or three years from now? Is I believe it's it 20, uh, 2024. Is right. So it's they three years. December 31, 2024. 30, so basically we got 36 months. They have to be allocated. Then I think we have some additional time beyond the Just December 31, 2024 to have them actually spent. But if I remember correctly, they must be allocated by December 31, 2024. Have to be allocated by December 31st, 2024. So it gives us three years to allocate these. Yes. I'm just looking in my head, okay, I got 36 months to get rid of $30 million. <laughs> I mean, I just how I'm looking at it. That's just how I'm looking at it. That's nothing. It's finance, Bill, right? That's right. <laughs> you and your friends in Japan. <laughs> Singapore. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Health Director. <laughs> yes, sir. Good to see you, Tony. Yeah. All right. Good morning, Chairman Paisley, <laughs> Vice Chair Cardi. Right. Four, four minutes, right? <laughs> four minutes to go. Um, as I always start out, I have to thank the men and women at the health department for just doing an awesome job and continuing to not only do their daily work and their normal roles, but this, um, the roles that they're assigned within the uh, COVID uh, response. So this today's update, um, as of this morning, we had 68 new cases, um, 858 active cases, 47 cases in the hospital, and 328 deaths. That is 13 more deaths um, since I reported to you uh, two weeks ago. Um, one thing I want to point out in this slide, if you notice the hospital is still at 40 seven um, our cases have been going down and i'll talk a little bit that about that in here in a second percent positive in cases per 100,000. so we've seen a decline but our hospitals have been hanging in there around the high 30s and 40s so we haven't really seen that move ideally those should be moving down together as as this goes so we'll continue to monitor that that piece of it um, we closed out the month of uh, september where uh, zero to 17 year old uh, made up 28% of our cases um, at 872 cases, and that was the highest we've had from that age group since the beginning of the pandemic. 
Um, and then 25 to 49 was the, the highest percentage at 34 percent, right? This is um, not too surprising. This is the folks that are out in the workforce and, and out in public and the general spread and interacting with the people every day. And then for the month of October, we just started October, we're only four days in, but those two age groups um, continue to lead just with four days in and the amount of cases coming in. The additional deaths, do you have any idea what kind of what average age that's been? So our average age, um, and I'll get that's when I get to that slide, okay. but has has decreased to lower to about 59 before it was, was higher, right around 64 or 65. Thanks. So we've seen that drop a little bit. It's decreased to what now? I'm sorry? What did you say, 50? 59. 59 and a half is what we averaged it out a few weeks ago. Is that working, Bruce? <laughs> well, all right, so we are still in a high transmission spread, um, but our cases per 100,000 have gone down. Um, last reported was uh, 365 cases per 100,000 over seven days. Um, we were right around in the 430s, 440s the last couple of weeks since we hit that kind of that plateau. So we've seen that drop. Our percent positive has gone down, not, not too much. Um, it, was, it was hanging around 11.3%. We're right at 11%. Uh, but it is starting to trend down a little bit, so that is, that is encouraging. This is our hospital slide, which is updated data, or daily excuse me, by Cohn. Um, relatively unchanged. Um, most most as I reported the last couple of weeks, the majority of folks in the hospital and the ICU and on ventilators are unvaccinated. And these are our deaths since uh, since January first of this year. Um, so what I'll point out for this slide is really the age groups. So from zero to nineteen, we've seen zero deaths. From twenty to thirty-nine, since I last reported to you, we had an increase of two deaths, so that brought up to five in that age group. Forty to fifty-four, we've had an increase of two deaths at thirteen. Fifty-five to sixty-four, one death. Sixty-five to seventy-four, four deaths, and seventy-five and older, four deaths. Our outbreaks in nursing homes and residential care centers uh, currently at six. That's an increase of two since I last reported back on September 14th. Um, and clusters, uh, zero in child care, and then K through 12 schools, seven. That's an increase of four um, since I last presented to you. Our vaccination rate. So total population, and I'll just go down the fully vaccinated numbers, so I don't <coughs> hate them all, but fully vaccinated total population is 49.3. For 12 and older, 57.5%. 18 and older, 59.4%. And 65 years and older, 81.7% are fully vaccinated. Our 12 to 17, when we kind of break out that population, uh, is 39.5%. So when I last reported in September, that's about a percent higher. Um, so about 5,370, those 12 to 17 have been vaccinated. I have total population estimated at about 13,000. And I have, oh, there it is, good. And then, so last slide, this is just a reminder, we continue to do mobile outreach out in the community, events when we can get out there. Um, appointments and walk-ins, um, our same-day scheduling over our human services camp, uh, campus. And last week, we started our MassVax booster drive-through. Um, and so we did over 600 and 600 and over 600 last week um, through the drive-through events, just over three days. And they're actually getting ready to start uh, today. Our appointments have been filling up within one day. So there's definitely a high demand for boosters out there. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. just want to say thanks for all the great work Absolutely. that you guys have done. Thank you. Amen to that. Thank you. Could Thank it, you. Was there anything um, like clear? I know at the board meeting for the school system last week, I think it might have been Patsy or one of the board members asked about a policy. And if you had the power over that policy, but I don't think the county or the school system has a mask policy. Do you remember what I'm talking about? They were talking about how can she was asking you nicely right. um, about um, how can you make the decision about the mask required K through 12 if it's not a ABSS policy 
because I think there was determined that the ABS didn't have a policy and neither does the county. So how does the health department trump? Do you know what I'm trying? Do you I remember that it, conversation? I think what you were talking about it was a, re re uh, a requirement versus a recommendation. Right. Gotcha. So it had to do with quarantine authority. Yes, that yeah. was a fun so, conversation. So, <laughs> right. Versus 14. Like so, right. Yeah. So my recommendation was the 14-day quarantine in line with the CDC. However, I did not issue formal quarantine orders. That was gotcha. that was where the discussion was around. So yeah. does does like the school system and the count does there need to be a policy about something like that? So that's in their school kit, the school toolkit yeah. and the plan that was put forward. So it's in the plan, the school plan for the many layered strategies to prevent COVID-19 in the schools. Or not that, because that's, not, not that's that's it's actually part of the plan. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. I just wondered because that was a that was an interesting conversation. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly was. You could do Congress. <laughs> <laughs> need a bigger bet. <laughs> I mean, there's all questions we all need those answers to. It's, it seems like every time you turn around, it's something different. That 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 man that's on TV talking about Christmas now. <laughs> I can't wait till Christmas. Yeah. Okay, I think you're next. I am next. Yeah. So. Um, this is a grant that we received from the State Division of Public Health uh, to advance um, health disparities and health equity um, for COVID-related items. Uh, the amount is $39,900. There is no local match to this. Um, basically, we look to use this money. The, the, really, the grantor has laid out what our deliverables are, such as providing annual staff on health equity or social determinants of health for um, uh, for our, our our staff to do training, um, but the money really going to be used for is to implement a communications and messaging campaign addressing COVID-19 prevention and vaccinations for populations that are higher at risk, underserved, or disproportionately affected. And where are the funds coming from, the state? They are they are federal pass through, so they're from the feds, pass through the state, and then in the form of our what we call our agreement addendums. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Unanimous. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. We're now down to public speakers. We have two. Mr. James Walker. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I believe this is the third time I've been up here. I hope it's the last time. <laughs> uh, what I would like to ask, y'all consider making an ordinance of this trash deal. I come home from church yesterday, had to go get a broom and a dustpan and clean all the trash out of the, dry, out of the road. The, comes by my house. I live at 3710 Mount Wollen Road, Hall River, uh, right off Pitchpole Highway. It's right going to the dump. Somebody had come by the house, bag of trash, big black bag in the middle of the road, beer bottles, about 200 uh, bottle caps off the beer bottles, broken glass, Somebody had a good party oh, Saturday night. That sounds like a bar. <laughs> and uh, boxes, white beer boxes, four of them. And I called the sheriff's office. Well, they sent a nice deputy down there, a lady. And I thought maybe, you know, they could take primal prints, but they couldn't do that. So anyway, like y'all to make an ordinance that when they go down to the landfill, they got the trailer full of trash tied down. When I went to school, they had four sides to a trailer, a pickup. I reckon it's still out there. But anyway, and that's you can tie down four corners in the middle and the back. And y'all can make ordinance for them to find them and let the landfill write the ticket down there or whatever you got to do. The Sheriff's Department is doing all they can do. And somebody's dropping the ball somewhere. So that's what I'd like. 
Y'all make ordinance to start finding and uh, collect the money down there at the landfill. And also let Orange County go to Orange County and take their trash. Don't bring it to Alamance. Amen. Alamance, we got a landfill in Orange County, let them take it down there. Mr. Albright, the regulation we have for tarping, that only pertains to dump trucks and trash trucks carrying materials down to the landfill, is that correct? Anything that has a trailer or a truck. truck so we already have a regulation to that effect? Yeah, but they don't do it. And now these companies is hauling trash up and down the road too. They got to roll the tarps back but they don't pull the side down. Trash is all out, coming out the sides. Well, you got a bag full of bottles. It almost has to be picked up and dropped out in order not to, I mean, it's not yeah, going to blow out the back of a truck. Paper, normally. bottles, and everything's coming out all over the road. Could you, um, just a thought, could you, um, could, the, could the landfill, when they see someone pull in that doesn't have their stuff tied, could they go ahead and find them right That's then? That's exactly right. Go make ahead and find a, them right then. No, make an ordinance. Go ahead and it. sign a sign a fine sheet and what do you think, hand Sheriff it to them. Johnson? That'd be great. <laughs> There's personally no provision to do so. You don't really have the legal right to do so. Right. I can so see that. according to the board, and I, I have no ability to enforce the law. Gotcha. You but with pay. a, uh, if we pass an ordinance, would that give you the authority Yes, sir. To do well, that. I think you, you run into a dubious conversation because if you've got mm -hmm. people coming untarped, you know, you can write a provision that you turn them away or you're putting them right back on the road. Yes. You can give me the authority to charge them extra. Mm -hmm. Something I could do. Um, but I don't have the legal right to write a ticket, nor do I think I would yeah. ever have that right to write a ticket. Right. right. Didn't we and ask then this is all a provision of state law regarding the specifics of how trash is transported, how high it can be in a trailer or a truck. So all of this is covered under state law. And there's multiple levels of it about how much you can, the sheriff could uh, petition for charging them according to the grievance. Would this not be appropriate for something for our legal department to uh, undertake and report back to us at our next meeting. Mr. Ha uh, Mr. Haygood, would that be appropriate? Certainly. Well, yes. Mr. Johnson, would you have, would the Sheriff's Department have any way to enforce something like that? We, if you uh, see we them hauling it. If we catch them on the road and the trash is blowing out. But some things, you know, we can't put them all over Alamance County because we don't have any deputies, but when we catch them, we can write them a ticket. But, when they come into the landfill, they may be putting a deputy down there and they're not got it covered, you know, we can write a ticket there, but something, I, I agree with Mr. Walker, something needs to be done. Oh, I agree. Bad, yeah. in here, in Alamance County. Yeah. Well, Mr. Haygood, if you'll report back to us at our next meeting with the recommendation of legal counsel as to this matter. I don't think we're in a position to take any votes today uh, without the recommendation of legal counsel. What about the litter signs that we had talked about? Thousand bucks to litter or whatever it is? I yeah, they used to have them. it years ago yes. when I was a young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we actually, uh, our maintenance department has identified templates for those signs. I think they're prepared to make them. Uh, we need to make sure with DOT, which I think Mr. Archer is coming at a uh, meeting upcoming, our new engineer over the county. We need to make sure with DOT that it's okay for county government to install those signs in the right of way. Generally, DOT installs signs, but our, our sign shop's capable of making those signs and have identified the template for it. So. But again, we'd have to have an ordinance mm -hmm. to enforce the fine. Yeah. I think uh, we wouldn't want to put up any signage that, that was any different than state law now. I'm not sure if state law currently prevents littering. I would imagine there's some ticket that could be written if they see you throw a trash out the window of the car. So all we've looked at is could we make the signs? We can. We, we know what it would look like. Um, I think we would want to make sure with DOT that it's okay with them if we if our folks go out and start installing them. Uh, and I think we were interested too to know maybe from the sheriff's office if they had a recommendation for 
roadsides in the county that are particularly bad. If y'all are getting calls for, uh, you know, I know we have the inmate litter pickup as well as uh, you get a lot of calls about litter in general. So. Right, right now, you know, we were doing pickup trash, but the, all the uh, trustees has gone. We're waiting for another group to come in so we can get them out on the road. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the littering law is a state law. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know if, if Tide could possibly, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, could look into if they come into that uh, uh, dump down there with the uncovered, is there something that could be done by the county on the ordinance to, to write a citation? And if that happens, you know, I don't mind sending them deputy down there to write one. If, Mr. Every, Albright, would, would two weeks give you the, I'm uh, Albright, Mr. Albright and Mr. Hager, would two weeks give you the time you need sure. to come back to us? Sure. Every violation of a county ordinance is a misdemeanor. Well, it's a lot. fine associated with that. So if they drive into this landfill, and Richard says you're not tarp. Well, I work. Sheriff can write him a ticket. I worked with the state thirty years. I was Department of Transportation. I retired from there. So I got a few connections here and there. So I mean, I can call some and see about the signs or whatever, if you would like. But if you work with Mr. Haygood. Uh, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, yeah when I started with a shovel in the bully shacks, and when I <laughs> retired, I was road maintenance supervisor over Alamance County. Yes, right. Nice. So, you know, I've done pretty good for myself. Well, just, just know that littering is a, is a behavior that people know they're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Let me ask y'all just a question. Do you remember several years ago we had a drought? And the thing about the water table and all that said, when you're brushing your teeth, do not leave the water running. How many of y'all picked up running the water again? I, that stuck with me. I mean, it's like, I don't dare do that. But that's a behavior that you have to break. And I know that you probably think this is silly, but everybody knows you're not supposed to litter. But it's just slack, slackness. I mean, I can be in downtown and somebody will flip something out. I'm thinking you just don't respect what actual law is. Law doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be, and people need to respect that. If you start telling everybody everything to do every day, you're going to be like what we hear on the national news. People have got to take self-responsibility and just not do this mess. I mean, Amen you can rule that. people to death. I'm going to ask y'all's wives when y'all brush y'all's teeth. Well, <laughs> they used to have signs on the road. You see my wife. They used to have the signs on the road. I had not seen one no telling how many They disappeared. Years. They really have. Yeah. And, um, well, I'm gonna the sign ain't going to help them, you, though. You've gone way beyond our three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you did. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank <laughs> you so much. This is but, important. Yes. It really is. So I need to get with this gentleman right here, right? Yes, That's correct. You and everybody else now, Miss County. Well, I need to start writing some about five hundred thousand dollar tickets on these big trucks going up and down the road. You know what? You're exactly right, sir, because you will get the behavior that you accept. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Unfortunately we have And to Mr. That Johnson's right. doing the job he ought to do. But anyway, I'll get back to week. We appreciate it. Thank you. Your wife. This is Bobby Chen, who's our next speaker. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Bobby Chen, Secretary of Alcovets, and I thank you for this opportunity to extend an invitation to the Board of Commissioners, the County Super Manager, as well as the department heads within the department to come to a groundbreaking ceremony at Chestnut Ridge, where we will be having a brown, excuse me, a groundbreaking ceremony for the Chestnut Ridge Campus for Veterans at 1765 Fire Tower Road on Saturday, October 9th at 11 o'clock. This facility will be for veterans uh, and through the gracious donation of a member of Alamance County, we, have, uh, we are ready to begin the first phase of groundbreaking and building uh, retreat facility there so I hope we see you there yeah. uh, I will send an invitation to Mr. Haygood to forward to you where you can RF RSVP to me that was Thank Saturday the 9th at 12 11 o'clock 11, 11 yes, o'clock Saturday October 9th, 9th. Okay. 
And give and, us the address again, please, sir. And the address, the address is 1765 Fire Tower Road. We're right on the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Been there. And the appropriate attire would be outdoor because it is wooded. <laughs> <laughs> so no coats and ties, correct? No coats and ties. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Boots are encouraged. Thank you so Absolutely. much for you guys, what you do. You're amazing. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, Thank you thanks. so much for coming. Commissioner's responses. I think we messed up and did our commissioner responses while the speakers were here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Any other comments? I just, people have looked at me like, what are you wearing today? And my shirt represents the 22 veterans that take their life every month in this country. And that's 22, way too many. And we need to look at some of the data too with law enforcement because that's starting to be a serious issue as well. And we thank you. Thank you, absolutely. Okay, Mr. Haygood. Uh, Commissioners, an item I have to bring to your attention also has to do with uh, waste in Alamance County. So, uh, as you know, Republic Waste and Waste Industries serve areas of Alamance County per approved franchise agreements. And both of these groups, Republic and Waste Industries, are allowed to increase their fees for customers after two years of going through their uh, franchise agreement. So, Republic Waste and Waste Industries uh, have indicated to uh, Richard Hill, who's here with us today, Director of the Landfill, that Republic and Waste Industries do plan to increase their fees for uh, customers beginning January 1st, 2022. Their increase will be by 9.24%. They are required per the franchise agreement to notify the Board of Commissioners of this. Uh, we've received letters through Mr. Hill indicating this information. Um, Richard's here if you have any questions about this, but uh, this is per the approved franchise agreement, so this is their prerogative as companies to do. I believe that is their plan. And this gives uh, citizens uh, a quarter to be prepared for the coming increase. So, uh, Richard, do you have anything to add or anything? The bank of January 1st building the last quarter of this year. And that was 9.4% increase? Yeah, that's tied and to a CPI that's included in the uh, agreement, and that was from January 1st of 19 to July. Of so, that's a, it's a two year 9% increase. Two and a half years. It's 9.24. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, well, dead on. But the bulk of that occurred this summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With everything that's going on with inflation. Yeah. Well, they hit it right on the head. And four, that does not seven. require any action on our part. No, this is uh, this is part of the agreement with the uh, with the providers. They can they can do this, but they do have to notify the commissioner. So I'm notifying you of their intent. And that's the only uh, item that I have. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, it's all good. All good. Thank you very much. Any commit anything else, Mr. Hayhead? No, sir. All right. Any other commissioner comments? I like the, the T-shirt and what it represents. Mm -hmm. yes. Do I'm, I have I'm a Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll second. move. <laughs> second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other 
other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.